so before I get going, who here have I actually branded? Give me a hell yeah. Ooh, Jesus. So you guys are going to be pretty happy because you're going to see all the stuff we're talking about and you're going to be super stoked because you got all the tools. And then the rest of you will probably be pretty miserable and depressed and kind of upset because maybe things aren't exactly where you want your brand to be. But before I get started, I want to kind of address the elephant in the room. It's been a lot of chatter online, a lot of controversy. And I think we need to clear the air once and for all about this. And um, I just wanted to go on record as saying that um, I got nothing to do with this fucking logo. <laughs> All right? These people are using my good name to try to sell cheese. All right? And the logo is awful. All right? The logo is awful. Why is it awful? We can actually talk about that. But you look at that, and if you knew nothing else about Antonelli's Cheese Shop, it doesn't really look like a place that you would get great cheese. Why not? Well, because the lettering sucks, the topography sucks, it's amateurish, and it looks weak. Okay, so those are all things we're going to talk about, but I have no relation to, the, to these people. I thought it was actually be, would be fun for me to actually rebrand them and like send them a new logo and actually fix it for them. Uh, but anyway, so I just want to clear that up. You guys thought I was going to be talking about the memberships versus reviews thing? Yeah, no, I ain't talking about that. I ain't going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. You know? You know? I don't know. I, I still think maybe you need some memberships. I mean, I, I could be wrong. But anyway, so, so about me, you guys, some of you know who I am. I run an agency called Kick Charge. Uh, we have about 20 employees. Um, I've overseen the creation of about 2,000 home service brands over the last... I don't know, I'm doing this like 27 years. I'm doing it a pretty long time. Um, I wrote a few books. I just published a new book. By the way, if you are a VIP member, you actually get a copy of my book with your ticket. So please stop by our booth and I will autograph it. It will be worth hundreds as soon as I die. So please stop by and get your copy. So we look and view our work as if we have the responsibility to change the lives of the people who hire us. Um, and that is an amazing responsibility. It is amazing to see when that transpires. I'm so blessed to hear all the success stories of our clients, and that's my why. So, so grateful to be able to serve the trades and to really help change people's lives. So, here's me rocking a mullet when I was 16 years old, um, actually hand lettering a plumbing company van. And just to show you how long I've been at it. Um, was always passionate about it. And uh, this is for a plumbing and heating uh, van. Um, I was lettering for a company in Staten Island, New York, actually. If you can hear my accent, I am from Staten Island originally. Oh. Staten Island's in the house? Yes? Excellent. Um, I'm from New Jersey now, though, so my accent isn't as bad. So, overspending on advertising is the tax that a business um, Overspending on advertising the tax businesses spend for being unremarkable. Okay, so what does that mean? The whole, basically, the whole philosophy of the book is that the weaker your brand is, the more money you need to spend to market it. Okay, so that, I want you to really think hard about that. A lot of our clients live in the less than 5% of, of revenues that they spend on their marketing. Well, how can they spend 5% and still grow? Like I thought you needed to spend 10% or 12% or things like that. Of course, different markets are gonna be, you know, it's gonna vary, but the stronger your brand, the less money you need to spend on marketing, okay? So yeah, weaker the brand, the more money you need to spend. So just really think about that. You can overcome poor branding by just spending more money, but how about we just fix the branding first and then not need to spend as much money on advertising. I would rather do that instead. So think about your brand, think about who you're trying to market to, and your key demographic is largely a woman demographic, okay? And she really has no clue who you are, okay? And of course, Google loves you for that, because what does that mean? It means you have to spend more money trying to get her to figure out who you are. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind a disruptive brand strategy is to get her to know who you are 
and to get her to feel something about what that experience might be if she chose to hire you. Okay? 84% of the, your potential customers have no idea who you are. Think about that for a minute. 15% maybe know who you are. So you're spending all your marketing on 84% of the people trying to get them to know who you are. So the whole point of having a brand that is memorable, that delivers brand promise, is so that when she's ready to actually hire you, she just types in your name into Google. That's what we talk about winning on the street. Instead of actually typing in heating repair Las Vegas, she's typing in the name of your company. It's obviously much easier to show up higher for a branded search. You can ask any digital marketing company how a better branded company performs compared to a poorly branded company. So how do you build a remarkable brand? Obviously you brand and not bland. So when we look at different markets that we are asked to do brands for a, for a company and we look at the competition, there's usually not very many well-branded companies in that space. So key points, investing in your brand makes all your marketing work better. Generally speaking, most of your competition is not leveraging a good brand. So how do we capitalize on that? We build a better brand than they have. Most, brand, most companies here, like you guys are here because you want to learn how to run an amazing company. What I want to try to do is make sure that your company looks as good as the work that you actually perform when you get inside the home. So that's what the brand is trying to control. It's trying to make Mrs. Jones think something positive about your company before you actually get in the door, okay? So obviously leveraging your, leveraging your vehicle, your truck wraps are so important. Most truck wraps are done really poorly. They don't infuse brand promise. And why are they poorly done? Because you don't have a great brand. So you're never gonna get a great truck wrap with a poor brand. So again, we're talking about winning the battle on the streets, making sure that they know your name when it's time for service. Don't confuse your truck as a point of purchase advertising. It's not, it's brand building. And the point of that brand building exercise is so that when they are ready for service, again, they simply type in your name. That's what we're trying to do, okay? Certainly recruitment is better, is better and easier with a good brand, okay? It looks like a place I want to work. And the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets to do. I have people that say, well, Dan, I'm at $10 million. I can't rebrand. It's too expensive. I'm like, well, dude, it's not going to get any cheaper when you're at $15 million. Okay, so just think about that as far as the cheapest time or the least expensive time to rebrand is really today. Not in a year, not in two years, because now there's just more stuff that you have to do, and you have the cost of all the missed opportunities because of that poor branding. So brand basics, I like to look at branding as like a wheel, okay? In the center of that wheel is your logo. And around that wheel are all the touch points that that consumer will interact with your brand, okay? Your outdoor, your social, your web design, TV, radio, print, etc. So you get that hub wrong, and that wheel is never gonna be round. And you can still turn a wheel that isn't round, it just takes a lot more effort. And effort is another word for money. Again, weaker the brand, the more money you need to spend. And without a good brand, all your advertising efforts are compromised. This is an example, I think he's here somewhere. Are you here, Sammy? Yep. Okay, he invested with us day one on branding. And zero to seven and a half million in 12 months, just bought his 55th van in 12 months. Day one, he rolls out, and he looks like a player. He looks like someone that is going to come to my home and deliver value, deliver a great service, be able to charge more, have higher average tickets, because he looks like a company that's coming in that is going to do good work. So a brand is what people say about you behind your back. You can't tell them what to say about you, but the idea is to help infuse in them an idea of what that might be like. You guys get in the door, you ring the doorbell, you perform great service, okay? What the branding is trying to do is to make them feel something about you before you ring the doorbell. That's really the bottom line. What does Mrs. Jones think about the experience she may get before you even walk in the door, okay? Every time they interact with your company, impressions are a form. What you say online, 
what that truck down the road looks like, what the uniforms on the guy are. All those things are forming impressions. Okay, take control of those impressions with a better brand. So again, look at this company here. They're out in New England. They're a hundred million dollar company. They didn't say, well, we're at a hundred million. Like, why should we change? Like, we're killing it. We're doing great. But they knew that this brand didn't actually represent who they were today. So we rebranded them. And right off the bat, they had a 16x increase in revenue directly attributed to the new wrap trucks. Okay, so you look at the ROI on that and how much money that the new truck wraps were generating. Not only just the money that they were generating, but look at the impression. You know, wh which one looks like a more professional company? Looks, which one looks like they should charge more money for their work? Another company here, um, $40 million in revenue, $60 million, something like that. 1884. I mean, honestly, you take off the 1884 and this company looks like they just started yesterday. So what do we do? We try to leverage the history, the heritage of this company and build a brand that infuses that brand promise. So what makes a good brand? They're disruptive. They don't fit in. They deliver that brand promise. They control the conversation before it takes place. Okay, so think about that again. Before you ring the doorbell, what does she think about the experience? They tell the story quickly and efficiently. They instill themes like confidence, security, longevity. Okay. Again, why is this a unique opportunity? Again, so many companies have really poor brands. So imagine if you had the best branded company in your community. If you were a household name within your community, what would that mean? How much less would you need to spend on pay-per-click? How much less would you need to spend on other channels? So again, many deliver great product and service. They just don't look like that. So a lot of examples of companies that we've branded, or rebranded, I should say, that by all benchmarks, we're doing really well. But instead of saying, hey, everything we're doing today is good enough for tomorrow, they said, no, we're gonna actually fix this problem and we're gonna build a brand that actually represents what we deliver. So success in spite of a poor brand, not a valid reason to perpetuate it. You know, you could look at Tommy from A1. By all benchmarks, Tommy was killing it. He was at $30 million when we rebranded him. Now he's at over $100 million in revenue. Tommy didn't say what I was doing was good enough. He didn't say, you know what, everyone knows my truck. Why would I ever change it? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of psychology behind why we rebranded Tommy and why we picked these colors. My book actually talks a lot about some of those decisions. Victor, another person who really, by all benchmarks, was doing really well, was on a really good trajectory. But you tell me, which company here looks like they could charge more money for their work. Is this one got a higher average ticket? Or is this one? Which one looks like a premium brand experience? You know Victor so well as far as what he does when he's inside that home and how well he performs that service. Ken Goodrich came to us. We rebranded him, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago, $7 million to $250 million in revenue. It's crazy. But look at the original. It was okay, but there was no story. There was nothing about that brand that I was interesting, that you could build on. I don't want you to get the impression that you put a shiny new brand on a poorly run company, and that's gonna fix all your problems, because it's not. Obviously, you need to have the internal operations functioning properly. Next thing to talk about that's really important is branding and consumer bias. Okay, I talk a lot about this in the book. Um, so what is it? Well, you think about the average homeowner. They're scared of you. They're scared about who's coming to their home. They don't know if they need a new capacitor. That was a really New York accent right there. Um, or if they need a whole new condenser unit. They don't really know. How do we infuse that trust? How do we get them to believe something positive about you? And again, remembering women as your demographic that your brand needs to speak to, okay? This guy is coming over and he's gonna beat the shit out of you if you don't pay your bill. <laughs> Here's a pro tip here. Look at your logo and if he looks like he can beat the shit out of somebody, I highly recommend you rethink that strategy, okay? He may be cool for you. Maybe your techs think it's really cool that he's all muscled and he's tough 
you know, because we're tough guys. But Mrs. Smith is already scared shitless about who's coming to her home. Let's not make her even more scared, okay? So this guy, yeah, you could tuck me in actually. I'd be cool with that. So what did we actually do there? What did we actually speak to? We spoke directly to her and we tried to figure out a way to make her feel comfortable with who is coming to her home. You know, you may have some owners say, well, like, that's like too, that's like too girly for me. And I'm like, well, dude, it's not about you. Get it out of your head that your brand has to be about you. It's not. It has to be about who you're selling to. Make sure your brand communicates to them. When you get the results, I guarantee you'll love your girly brand if that's what you want to call it, okay? But think about them. So why is it so hard even about average tickets, right? So the hardest problem about increasing average ticket, and it's really easy for people to come up and say, hey, raise your prices, right? You should definitely raise your prices. And of course you gotta know your numbers. You have to know all those things. But you have to make a reason, a valid rationale for that homeowner to believe that there's actually a valid reason why they should pay more for your service. And that's the problem that most guys run into, is that you can't deliver brand promise with your current branding. You can't make her believe that there's actually a reason why you should be charging more for your work. So you fix that, and before you ring that doorbell, She's already established an impression of the experience and an impression of what she might think it should cost, okay? So how do brands counter bias? They put customers at ease. They make them feel things like trust, honesty, integrity, okay? They diffuse the negative stereotypes, okay? They make people feel confident in their choices. They match the deliverable and they take control of the conversation with their brand. Just again, a couple examples. I always love these trucks. They're on fire and they're frozen. Um, so five trucks eight, eight years ago and he just sold for $50 million. You can see the difference between the two brands. One looks, you know, not on fire and the other one looks a lot more friendly. Um, so when is it time to rebrand? It's always a hard question. You know, people ask me all the time, like, hey, should I rebrand? So you gotta be introspective about that. You gotta look at who you represent and say, is this who we are today? And I get it, you guys start a company, sometimes you're bootstrapping, you're doing it the cheapest way you can, maybe the sign guy did it, or the truck wrap guy did it, or something like that, and that's cool, and it gets you to where you are. But is it who you are today, is really the question. So, does your brand blend in? Does it look similar to other trucks in your market? You know, when it's coming towards you, do you know that that's your truck? Can you distinguish it? Um, when you realize certainly that maybe you're spending more on marketing than you should, you start creeping into the 10, 11, 12% range of your ad spend, well, why? Like, why do we need to be spending so much? Can we fix the root problem before we reinvest all this money into advertising? Again, like I said earlier, you can outspend or spend your way out of poor brands, but why, why do that? Wouldn't it be better just to fix it? So certainly, the other part of it is a lot of ego involved. You know, and you can look at Victor, and Victor has just like a tiny ego. That was a joke, by the way. Um, yet he rebranded. He didn't say, oh, dude, like my logo's awesome, like why would I ever change it? No, he looked at it and he said, you know what? I can't get to where I want to go with what I have currently. And that takes courage, that takes guts, like I get it. But make sure that it represents who you are today and actually where you want to go in the future, okay? So I like this, uh, this little graphic here. Um, if anyone's seen the movie Spaceballs, the um, character there gets his head turned around, and he looks at his, his pants and says, why didn't anyone tell me my ass was so big? So the reason why I bring that up is because probably no one is ever gonna tell you that your brand sucks. Um, I can if you'd like, um, I'd be happy to. Um, but the reality is, is the people that you're asking aren't even the right people to be asking that question to. Your employees, are probably not gonna be the ones to tell you. You know, because they, they think, well, may, that might insult you. I don't have any skin in the game, but I look at it from an objective standpoint. Does it meet all the objectives that we spoke about earlier, okay? I also created this handy graphic to identify whether you have a poor brand. Um, if your logo is on here, uh, see me after class, I'll be glad to talk to you about that. <laughs> but in all seriousness, what's happening here? All these are blending in, okay? So the red and blue arrows, 
You know, the, the, the snowflakes in the sun, it's very difficult to own those things. Okay, you hear a lot of guys justify some of these things and say, hey, everyone tells me they see my vans all over. Okay, that's great. That's step one. Step one is being noticed. Okay, step two is trying to figure out what does that, what does that impression leave with the homeowner? And that's the part that many people get wrong. They build a brand that doesn't instill brand promise. Okay? So being seen is only half the battle. Don't mistake visibility with delivering brand promise. Those are two different things. The ideal world is to deliver brand promise and to be disruptive at the same time. Okay? A lot of people try. It's very difficult to actually make that happen. And here's an example. You would say, well, this truck is disruptive because it's bright orange and I can see it. I can sort of read the name. It's a little tough to read Culpepper, but I could sort of read it. But he had zero phone calls. And how do we know? He's using service Titan. He's got the call tracking, so we know. Okay? Zero phone calls to 80 phone calls in nine months. That's how we know. That's the difference between something that's blending in and not actually delivering brand promise versus something that is more interesting and memorable and sticky in a consumer's mind. So another company here. On fire. It's uh, frozen. And worse than that, it's so hard to read actually the name of the company. Okay, and I thought he was here. Is Jamie here, Jamie Vaughn? Anyway, super good guy, $10 million company, by all accounts doing everything right, but this is the rebrand. So again, which company looks like they should charge more money or can charge more money? You can make the argument that this truck is disrupt disruptive and I see it all the time, but who looks like a more professional company is the question. And you could see the way all the trucks were done, okay? So certainly you don't need to suffer needlessly from WVS, which is my acronym for white band syndrome. Again, white bands, very difficult to be disruptive. They tend to all blend in, okay? So if your truck is white, I highly recommend just considering doing a wrap, okay? All the numbers prove that when they're done correctly, they do so much better than a white band, okay? So this particular company, just to show you an example, is primarily white. It's got some blue in there. This is the redesign. But the more important part of this is the results right after. Okay, so we talk about winning on the streets and what that means. Look at the organic traffic and the direct traffic. So direct traffic up 539%. And there was zero change in the rest of his marketing except for putting three vans on the street. Okay, so he puts three vans on the street and his direct traffic is up 539%. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. They're typing in his name now because they've seen it on the streets and they remember it. That's the whole point of this. Again, another white van, although this one's kind of white and dirty, um, and then the redesign. A couple examples here. So again, the most expensive logo you'll ever buy is one you paid the least for. And you think about what does that mean? And again, we talk about ROI and your marketing spend. We talk about missed opportunities. We talk about the fact that it's harder to recruit for your company with a poor brand. Come on. Uh-oh. I think I broke it. What happened, guys? Uh oh, no signal. Okay, all right, well, we're sort of back a little bit. So, yeah. Good, thank you. All right, so, Garage Door Doctor, another company, five and a half million to nine million in the two years since rebranding at a four and a half percent spend. That's the type of results that we're talking about. Less than five percent, and look at the growth in two years since rebranding. Uh, one and a half million to three million in one year, and then 50 million after seven years. Uh, Jason Bueller, I don't know if Jason Bueller's here. Bueller? 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 He's, he is here, but he, I guess he's not here. But what I love about this, not only his growth, 4x the business in four years, which is great, two and a half to 12 million, but what I love about this is the increase in average ticket from 6,100 to 10,600. They were previously called. Air Source America, which is a great name if you're selling oxygen. 
um, but maybe not so much for a heating and air conditioning company. And his last name is Bueller. And we're like, well, how did, how did we miss this? Like, that was kind of a, that was kind of a no-brainer. But uh, we missed that opportunity, but we renamed him back into Bueller. Um, and same percent ad spend, less than 5% to go from 25 to 12 um, in 48 months. And these are just a couple other examples of some ones that we've done, as you can see. Colors, super important, right? Think about colors that are unique in your market, okay? I say here, don't choose red, white, and blue. Well, why do I say don't choose red, white, and blue if you can avoid it? Um, because there's a lot of companies in your market that are probably already using red, white, and blue. Um, it's associated with the American flag, which we say, well, isn't that a good thing? Well, I want my company's brands to be associated, my company's brand colors to be associated with them only. I don't want you to look at my company's colors and think about anything else but them. Are there a lot of successful red, white, and blue brands? Yeah, I mean, Victor's doing really well with it. But you can see how we did the trucks in a manner that was so much more disruptive than just the traditional red, white, and blue there. So unique colors will aid in recognition. Try to avoid using common colors. Research your market before you determine what brand colors to use in your market. Like when we do it for our clients, I'm looking at the top five to 10 companies in that market, and I'm trying to say, what are the opportunities here? If I see five red, white, and blue trucks already in this market, then that's off the table. I can't put another one on the street because I'll never own those brand colors. Okay, so just try to look at that research and try to say, how can I pick colors that no one else is using in my space so that I can own those colors? Think about colors that are unique, that you don't typically see together, things like that, okay? This is a company we branded in Fetch a Tech. Probably the smartest thing I've ever done in my life is to actually uh, put some money and equity into this company. So I actually own a small piece of this company, and I'm super proud of that. <laughs> Fetch a tech. <laughs> um, so why do we pick these colors? Um, it's in the Vegas market. They're out here. Because these colors are not represented at all. So it's a very, very conscious decision about what brand colors to pick for this particular company. And that was based on this market. So before I said, we're gonna be these colors, I looked at all the competitors, I looked at what was already happening in this space, and I said, let's do colors that are different, okay? Another color company here, zest, orange and purple, and apple green. Doesn't sound like any of those colors would ever make any sense together, but you put them all together, and now they don't look like anyone else in their, their space. True blue, another really cool use of colors. You could say, well, I really wanna have blue. Well, then pick blue in another color that you don't typically see together. Brand names and taglines, again, super important with naming, okay? Some of you are fighting such an uphill battle with your name, okay? And you're working so hard. If your name is based on initials, if your name is based on your last name, very, very challenging to have people remember that, okay? So strongly consider if those things are working against you and whether or not you can change. So uh, think about names that connect um, visuals and images and emotions. So a name that conjures up a symbol is going to be inherently easier for that consumer to remember. Think about that impression of that vehicle driving by. I've got two seconds to look at it. Can I remember it when I need service? That's the whole point. That's why initial-based brands are so hard. You know, TGS, heating and air. I can't associate a visual with it that will make me think TGS. I can't, you know, think about something that is a, a brand promise associated with a last name or initial base. So those are also things to really think about. Obviously, make sure you do your research about naming as it relates to trademarks, things like that, okay? You know, this is just a couple examples of some companies we've renamed in phase electric, more of a technical term, doesn't necessarily speak to brand promise, and then over the moon. So again, why did we call them over the moon? Because we wanted to talk about the experience that Mrs. Jones would get if she chose to hire them. So the over the moon, well, you're gonna be over the moon with our service. We could tell a brand story based on that, where we couldn't tell one with Inphase. Uh, Bumble Breeze here in Vegas, um, you know, Vegas Strong unfortunately became associated with a shooting out here. Obviously that was not delivering that nice warm fuzzy that Mrs. Jones really was hoping to get. So we had to change that name and we changed it to Bumble Breeze and those guys are crushing it, doing really well. Um, again, it's another company here, really hard to even understand the name of the company based on the previous truck wrap. We just renamed them Jackrabbit. We picked two colors that were very unique. And now when you say Jackrabbit, you close your eyes you close your eyes, and you say the word Jackrabbit in your mind. You already have a visual. That's why it becomes more sticky. Um, hop to it, you know, renamed from 24-7, which sounds more like a description of a company rather than an actual name of a company. 
Um, Rise and Shine, the previous company name, Garage Door Repair Company, which also sounds like a description instead of an actual brand name. Plums up. I already think something positive. It's going to be a positive experience. Do it right plumbers. Well, it's hard to think do it right plumbers is coming to my house and they're going to do a shitty job. I mean, it sounds painfully obvious, but that's much better than TGS plumbing. I don't know what kind of job I'm getting from TGS plumbing. Um, all heart, Dylan Rucker, I don't know if Dylan's in the room, but we renamed him. His was an initial base brand. It was DNS, Heating and Air. And that was the big challenge, was we couldn't assign brand promise to DNS. We couldn't assign a visual that every time people saw that visual, they would think DNS. But we renamed them all heart, and then the tagline, comfort is only a heartbeat away, to go along with that story. So a lot of you, a lot of you talk about the challenges of recruitment, and I get it. There is really a shortage of qualified and skilled labor. I get it. I understand that. But I want you to really make sure that you're creating an environment and in a culture that attracts people as well. And sometimes you look at people that complain about recruitment challenges, and then you look at their space. You look at their brand. You look at the trucks that they're going to have to drive. And I say to myself, well, I don't think I'd want to work there either. So that's a hard thing to think about introspectively, right? To look inward and to say, does it really look like a place that I want to work to? You guys are going to have the honor of hearing Amanda speak a little while after me. And she's built one of the most amazing cultures I've ever seen in this industry. Amanda doesn't have the same recruitment problems that most of you probably have. And that's because she's built a culture that people are excited about working. They want to come work there. She has people calling them up to see about how they can work there. So just look inward and just say, is there a reason why maybe people don't want to work for us? What can we do to project that positive impression? And let's look at our own space. Let's think about branding our space. Let's think about creating uniforms that people are proud to wear, things like that. So culture and branding work together to attract talent, create internal environment, talking about internal things. Reinforce your core values and your mission visually. So when someone comes into the conference room, there's a reinforcement of your company's why. Okay? Um, uniforms, certainly business cards, all those things that they can be proud of. So here's Amanda's brand that we did for her, and her tagline, Forward is a Way of Life. Her revenue increases. She's gone from, I think, 60000 in residential sales a year to having her first million-dollar month in 12 months. Okay. That wasn't a mistake or a typo. One million dollars in one month. And she was previously PMA Mechanical. We talked about the challenges with that. What brand story can we tell with PMA Mechanical? Right? So forward is a way of life. That's the whole vision, the whole mission of this company. And it's created such an amazing environment. And you know, I'm just so blessed to have worked on this brand. And I choke up a little bit when I think about what Amanda's been able to do. But anyway, so these are just some internal graphics that you can use throughout your space to create a better environment when people walk into your office. And you can see how the branding is infused in your space. So don't discount how important it is to have your space branded in a way that makes your employees feel proud, to make them understand what the mission is. This is actually my, um, my office and my um, conference room. This is Victor's uh, training room, where his core values are listed there. Again, reinforcing the company's why. And then uniforms. I mean, uniforms are obviously a great opportunity to really have the companies feel proud about wearing that brand. Okay? So just talk about branding mistakes, how to avoid them. Uh, certainly, let's get this right the first time. One of the biggest challenges I have as a design agency when I work with a client is they try to get everyone in their company on board with this idea can tell you that's really, really challenging. Um, some of the, I think some of the brands that we've done that I think got marginalized the most were when there was more and more people involved in that decision, okay? Especially people who don't understand branding. Um, designing for yourself instead of your target, target audience. Remember that the brand is designed largely for Mrs. Jones. So while I want input from you about what you like about certain brands that we've done and maybe certain ones that we haven't done, I always want you to remember that I'm not really designing a brand for you. I'm designing a brand for her. Okay? Uh, certainly make sure you hire the right people. Make sure you're dealing with people that really understand how brands need to live 
on very different mediums. So it's not just how cool it looks on your truck, but how will it function on your uniforms and your, and your business cards and your website and all those other mediums. A um, lot of really, really bad advice. Like, well, why did I write a book? Like, I wrote a book because I was so tired of some of the really, really bad advice being given to people, and then we have to fix that. And I feel, honestly, I'm pissed off because I think about all the wasted money and all the, from that bad advice. So I wrote this book to try to have people understand. Even if you can't work with us, like read the book so you really understand how this is supposed to work. But I hear things like mascots don't work or, or you need to look like a world-class company. I don't even know what a world-class company looks like, but I can tell you Mrs. Jones doesn't really give a shit about a world-class company. It's not about that, okay? So mascots don't work. <laughs> So just a couple examples of some companies. I mean, Amanda's got a, grass, a grasshopper. Seems to be, I don't know, Amanda's working okay? Seems like it's doing all right. Um, so just be careful about who you listen to. Another, another you know, company with a mascot, look at the you know, 10 times the inbound traffic um, one day after launching. So I know mascots work, especially when they're done correctly. A lot of mascots are not done correctly, so I understand that criticism. But just be careful about who you're listening to. Um, and then connecting your brand to your audience. Just make sure that every single thing that you put out that a customer may see is communicating your brand promise, is consistent, that looks like it's coming from you. Okay, I, I sometimes get crazy after we design a brand and then maybe the digital marketing company is doing their social media and they randomly decide to use a different font or different color scheme or there's no brand voice infused. Like if you look at your website right now, and you go on your website, and you simply change the name of your company, and you put the name of your competitor's name there instead, and read your website, if it reads exactly the same and still sounds perfect or sounds like normal, then what actually is unique about your company? What exactly is compelling about your brand story that Mrs. Jones would think that the experience she gets from you would be any different from anyone else? So the bottom line is, just don't be generic with your voice. Don't be generic with your brand, okay? And make sure that the message that goes out reinforces that promise. Uh, certainly when you hand out a brochure, okay? Making sure all those things are very consistently personified and communicated, okay? Outdoor vehicles, billboards, giveaways, okay? All those things, and we talked already about branding your office, okay? So where to go to get a new brand? Certainly try to partner with an agency or a design firm that has experience in this realm, that has worked in the different mediums, that understands how that logo needs to appear in all those different environments. And that's a really important part of it, okay? Um, just understanding how that logo has to function on your truck. Okay, your truck is the most critical representation of your brand. Like another pro tip I'll give you, if you, if you don't have your van featured prominently on your homepage, that's a huge mistake. Most of your customers probably identify with your van that has your logo on it more so than just your logo by itself. So make sure that you put your van on your homepage because as she's scrolling through, she's going to say, oh, wait, I, I saw that truck. I saw that truck in that neighborhood. I remember those guys. Um, but certainly think about how all these things need to function in those different environments. And that's where we see things go wrong. Like they can design something that maybe looks good on your website but it's not gonna function correctly on your truck or it won't look good on a uniform, things like that, okay? Be careful of crowdsourcing, okay? And I don't say that because obviously we don't crowdsource, but I wanna sort of protect you guys or let you guys know of the challenges or the potential challenges with crowdsourcing. I would say over the last several years, we've probably had, I don't know, 20 or 30 instances of trademark infringement that originated from a crowdsourced site. So what does that mean? It means that someone on a crowdsourcing site sold a brand that we created to someone that hired them on a crowdsourcing site. So this owner went to a crowdsourcing site, they simply took our logo, changed the name, and sold it back to them. Okay, that's a really, really expensive lesson um, that I hate to see happen, but it's happened frequently. So you wrap 10 trucks, and then you get a cease and desist letter from the owner of that trademark. So can it work? Has it worked before? Absolutely. But I want you to understand the potential pitfalls for that. Okay, I understand that not everyone has the budget to invest in it, but understand that potentially that could be a challenge, okay? Um, and do not use clip art ever, okay? So why do I say that? Because clip art cannot be trademarked. So what does that mean for you? It means that literally 
a competitor can use the same exact logo that you have, and you can't do anything at all about that because you, can, you can't own clip art. So that graphic that I had up there before with all the sun and the snowflakes and all those graphics, that's why those are also a bad idea because those are all pieces of clip art. Okay, you can't own those. Um, I think that actually was my last slide anyway. Oh, or maybe it wasn't. Yeah, I guess it was my last slide. So, I got five minutes. Does anyone have any questions for me? Really can't see if you did, but. Yes. I mean, I would, I would think realistically a budget by the time you take into, let's say, our fees. Like, our fees are going to be in between 15 to 20 to 25, depending on, again, what we're actually doing. If we're doing things like naming or renaming or things like that. Um, but then you have to obviously consider the cost to redo all the things that will need to be done over. So you have your vehicles and things like that. The company that we work with that actually is sharing a booth with us for the truck wraps, they actually can finance the cost of your truck wraps so that you could at least preserve some cash and some capital if you wanted to do something like that. But that's a generally a realistic budget, at least to start out, and then you take into account with things that you have to do over. Like, can we do our whole website over from day one? Well, maybe you don't have to do the entire website over from day one, but at least change the button colors, at least put the new logo on there, and then maybe has that as a phase two to really try to address that. One thing we didn't talk about, too, is the rollout of a rebrand. Okay, just be very careful about how you roll out a rebrand, right? So all these customers that you've been using all these years, they know, you know, maybe they know what your logo looks like or your old logo looks like. And we want to make sure that we get ahead of that communications to them. We want to tell them why we changed. Why did we rebrand? What does it mean for them? Did we get taken over? Is there new owners? So we'd like to send out direct mail to all the existing customers, email to the existing customers, social, okay, and letting them know, hey, you're going to start seeing our new trucks rolling out, and he here's why. What does this mean for you? If you go through a name change, really important, making sure you get ahead of those communications. Okay, we, we'll rename maybe 100 companies this year, okay? Um, we have yet to, re to have a company experience a net decrease in revenue subsequent to renaming, but we roll it out in a very strategic and very organized fashion. So we answer all the questions that they have. Because one of the big questions they have is, what about their warranty? Will you guys still honor the warranty that you guys installed last year under the old name? So you have to get ahead of those communications and make sure they understand the whys behind the name change. Yep. The expected turnaround time, like in general, um, or with us, like specific, what? With us, like right now, we're running about five months out for, for rebranding. So once you start with us, that process generally takes about four weeks once we have a kickoff with you. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Pickup trucks is a harder medium, obviously. It's just smaller space, smaller canvas. But we've definitely seen and have executed some really, really well-designed pickup trucks that are disruptive, that still de deliver brand promise, and still you know, deliver what uh, a full-size van does, but just in a smaller space. So yeah, you can definitely do it uh, with a pickup truck. Yes, in the back. Oh. He was there. See, he was here. He was sleeping, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great question, and it's certainly something that has come up more frequently nowadays. So, what have we done to try to counter that, or try to build brands that? you know, don't have that challenge or don't have that issue is we certainly look at brands like Grasshopper, which is an animal, okay? So there can't be any really, any challenges with going in that direction. The bear one is another way to sort of address that. But certainly it is a question that is coming up more frequently and we're, I, I think, much more cognizant of how to address that and make sure we take that into consideration as we're building a brand. I think that's a great, great question. It is definitely something that you have to be considering and thinking about as far as how inclusive can we create a brand that speaks to everyone. So yes, I appreciate that question. Yes. So with the name change, you're changing the URL of your website. Mm -hmm. So what kind of design and website touches would you expect when you're starting a new URL? 
So in the, in the times that we've done it, certainly working in coordination with the digital marketing company, they do redirects on all the existing pages on your old site to redirect them to a new site. In our experience, we've seen a short-term, perhaps, decrease in organic traffic. And then generally, if all the redirects are structured properly with Google and you let Google know this page now goes to this page, we haven't really seen that affected tremendously. But there will be probably a short term. Um, but we've never, like I said, we've never experienced a net decrease in revenue for anyone we've renamed subsequently. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The difference in what? Oh, as far as like what do we do or how do we tackle that or what's the difference in the strategies? Um, well, whether it's whether it's a hundred million dollar company or a one million dollar company, the objectives are are the same. Um, there's different aspects of considering rebranding a hundred million dollar company versus a one million dollar company that you have to consider as far as how much equity do we have in the existing brand. Like so it's not just you say your logo sucks and we have to rebrand you. It's what about your old logo and your brand is worth salvaging that we can maybe capture into a new brand. But essentially it's the same questions you would ask regardless. Now the logistics of rebranding a hundred million dollar company are obviously going to be much different than a one million dollar company, just the sheer size and the scope of the things that will need to be redone. But we always look at rebranding as something that is not gonna happen overnight. Like don't expect to roll out, although unless you're Jason Bueller who did roll out literally eight new vans like overnight. Like he closed up shop as one company and on Monday was a new company. That's generally not the way most people do it. There's a period of time where both brands live simultaneously. So, um, sorry, I'm not sure if that answered it, but I hope, hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes. So yeah, ch changing the, your, your Google page and all of the, your reviews, again, is just a process of letting Google know that this company name has changed. So you will not lose all your reviews if you were to rename your company, okay? Uh, we can help with that, or you know, your digital marketing company can certainly help with that, but either, either or. It's actually really not a big deal. And then changing your Facebook page and the name of your Facebook page, again, is pretty straightforward. Anybody Any, else? One more question. Wait, where did that actually come from? Is that God? Right here. It is I. One more question. No, I saw you put your hand up. I seriously What's that? You're lucky we weren't at an auction. You'd be out some money right now, sister. What? Anybody oh. else have a question? Last question? <laughs> I was like, where is that coming from? Going once, going twice. That's it? That's We're it. Good? Okay, right, friends, family, give it up for Mr. Dan Antonelli. <laughs>